his holy temple, that all the earth keep silent before him. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Our scripture this morning will be coming from Isaiah 61, verse 10. Isaiah 61, and verse 10. I'll be reading from the King James and read thusly. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with Jews. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. But he says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Joy in the Lord. Joy in the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, we thank you this morning for allowing us to come back to this holy house of prayer and worship. We thank you, O oh God, for allowing us to hear your word one more time. I ask, O oh God, that you bless each and every one of us today. Bless us with what you know we have, uh, we have a need of. And give, give us your holy word this morning and just make it nourishment for our souls as always. And as your word goes forth, allow your people to see more of me, more of thee and less of me. I ask all these blessings in the mighty, magnificent name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Joy in the Lord. If you read your Bible, if you read any of the writings of the major prophets, you'll find that the God we serve is very much concerned with the moral integrity and, and the justice in our daily lives. He is concerned about how we treat one another. He is concerned about us from the president of the United States down to the homeless person on the street. God is concerned about the king as well as the pauper. God is concerned about how we live. We, when we stand before God, we will not have to give an account for anyone else, but we will have to give an account for ourselves, amen? And how we live down here for God. Isaiah is considered to be one of the major prophets in the Bible, but the, the prophet's chief duty was to deal with the moral and religious issues in the life of his own people during that day. And it's the same way today. Preachers have a responsibility to tell their congregation, their community, their town, their city, their state, their country, their nation, what is right before God. Notice, if you will, that God never sent a prophet while a nation was walking upright or walking in obedience to God. But when the nation would stray so far away from God's ways and God's word, God would send a prophet. He sent a preacher and he would send them to the nation as a whole. Now God's words and God's ways were not heeded or always followed. So the prophet preached about what would happen. The prophet would preach of future judgment, which would come to pass because of sin. And yet the prophets not only spoke of future judgment to, judgment to come, but they would also preach about the future. God gave them a prophetic vision, and they were able to foretell of the future events that were to come. They were able to preach about how the nation of Israel would be scattered throughout the world. They were able to preach about how the nation of Israel would have a time when the restoration of the chosen people would bring them back to their own land. And most of all, they were able to preach about the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? Isaiah was a prophet with great vision. Isaiah saw so much until scholars 
that studied his writings and his prophecies began to label Isaiah as the eagle eye prophet. The eye of an eagle can see both forward and to the side at the same time. If you ever uh, seen fish swimming in the water, or swimming in the water, where else would they swim, right? Mo most fish are what you would call countershaded, meaning they are darker on top of the water and therefore harder to see from above than below. And fishermen have a hard time locating and seeing fish that you know float or f swim just beneath the surface of the water. And it's hard to see them because they look like a shadow from just even a short distance away. But the eye of an eagle can spot a fish in the water from several hundred feet above. Even while soaring, while gliding, while flapping his wings in flight, the eye of an eagle while flying at an altitude of a thousand feet over open country can spot prey over an area of a three mile radius. An eagle's eye it's almost as large as a human being's eye. Its sharpness is at least four times of that of a person with perfect vision. The eye of an eagle can identify a rabbit moving almost about a mile away. And the eagle's hearing is also pretty good. They, they can locate prey just, just by hearing their prey move. When it comes to the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah was an eagle eye prophet. He was able to see so, so much down into the future. It was as if God gave Isaiah a vision with a telescope and as, as, as if Isaiah was looking into the future through a, a magnified lens. And when you read the book of Isaiah, what you hear Isaiah saying is, he is coming. He's coming. God allowed Isaiah to see so much of the future until Bible scholars believe that there were two writers of Isaiah. The first writings speak of Israel. And the second part speaks of Jesus dying for our sins. But I suggest to you that the book of Isaiah is not the work of two writers, but the writings of one man with two messages. See, the writings of Isaiah are so long, they call it the second Bible. They call it like a mini Bible. There are 66 books in the Bible, but there are 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. And the writings of Isaiah, you know, it's like a mini Bible. But just how much did Isaiah see of Jesus? Listen to what Isaiah said about Jesus. He says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Isaiah saw this, and listen to this. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. He says, behold the virgin, shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. How did Isaiah know something like that? Isaiah pinpoints the birth of Christ. He prophesies about a virgin giving birth to someone whose name shall be called Emmanuel. And if you keep on reading Isaiah, Isaiah writes about the anointing of Christ, the family of Christ, the character of Christ, the gentleness of Christ. Isaiah is famous for for being able to look all the way down through the sands of time and see even the death of Christ. Isaiah chapter 53 talks about how he would uh, be despised and rejected of men, but the prophets uh, also talked as if he, it, you know, he talks as if it already had happened. And yet, Isaiah wrote his book, 66 books, 700 years before Christ even came on the scene. 700 years before Christ came on the scene and Isaiah had prophesied and talks about how he had done no violence. He even talks about how he had made his grave with the wicked. And yet the book of Isaiah stands on its own because of the fact God gave Isaiah so much vision. In the book of Isaiah, in the 66th first chapter, the verse says, And I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Isaiah makes his rejoicing in the Lord personal. And many times, joy is a personal thing. And some people may try to bring you down. Life may try to bring you down. The devil may try to bring you down. But if our joy is in the Lord, and because of the Lord, uh, and then, then we too should be able to rejoice. Amen? If Isaiah rejoiced 700 years before Christ even came on the scene, 
then what about us? We who are after the cross. Christ, I mean, Isaiah was before the cross, but, but we are after the cross. We know what took place on Calvary. We know what Christ went through to take the, away the sins of the world. We should be able to rejoice. Amen? Amen. I got a couple of amens. But let me talk about what Isaiah talked about. Because he says something about garments. The garments. And let me talk about this garment just for a little while. The word garment in the Hebrew is ata. And ata is a garment, which means a garment of praise. A garment of praise is much more than a piece of clothing casually thrown over your shoulders. It may be like a shawl, but it's a little longer. And you can literally wrap yourself up in this garment of praise. However, the garment of praise that God gives us is a garment that will leave no openings throughout which hostility or hostile elements can penetrate. It is a garment of praise. When you are praising God, you are wearing this garment of praise. When you are in praise mode, you have a garment of praise that, that repels and replaces heavy spirits of depression that this world tries to place upon us. And just like, a, like when you go to go, go to your closet and get a nice warm coat to go outside and you know it's cold and uh, you know, temperature's almost below zero and, and you, know, you need something that's gonna keep you warm, amen? So you grab something out of the closet and you put it on. And that's what we need to do with this garment of praise. We need to be able to put this garment of praise on whenever we feel depressed, whenever we feel distressed, we should stop and pray and ask God to put upon us a garment of praise. Dress for distress, amen? Hello, somebody. I know some of you got a whole lot of distress in your life. But when you put this garment of praise on, it's a garment of praise that, you know, when you say, well, Reverend Courtney, what does a garment of praise look like? Ephesians chapter five and verse 17 through 19 says, be not unwise understanding that or you understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? It says, be not drunk with wine in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul wants us to know about the garment of praise. Paul wants us to know that, that, that getting high with wine is temporary. Hello, somebody. Getting filled with the Spirit of God produces everlasting joy. Amen? Paul wants us to know that getting drunk with wine you're dealing with that old way of life. And it speaks of selfish desires. But getting filled with the Spirit in Jesus Christ is a better, a higher, a longer lasting joy that will cure our depression, cure our tension, and deliver us from the bondage of stress. Hello, somebody. Y'all don't look so joyful this morning. Anybody joyful? This? Anybody got joy this morning? Amen. I know some of you out there saying right now, yeah, I know, Pastor, but I like my wine. <laughs> Give me my wine and I'll be fine. Leave me alone with my Patron. Pastor, this is the holidays and New Year's coming up real fast. I got a date with a gray goose. Amen. I understand. But we, but we have to ask ourselves, how much Holy Spirit, well, don't ask ourselves, how much Holy Spirit do we have? But we have to ask ourselves, how much does the Holy Spirit have of us? Whew, shall I say that again? 